Hi, welcome to the Q&A recording of the film, Born in Evin, playing as part of 10th European Union Human Rights Film Days. Today, we are happy to be talking to the director of the film, Mariam Zare, who is joining us from Berlin. Hi, Mariam. Hello. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Um, Mariam, you're, an act you're actually an actress. Uh, you played real lead roles in feature films, worked for theater and television, and you have been awarded for your performances. Uh, born in Evan is the first feature film you directed. Um, so you were born in Tehran's notorious Evan prison during the Islamic Revolution. And in your film, you're sharing your journey with us uh, to bring together the missing parts of your birth story in Evan. Um, you actually explain the reason why you made this film in the beginning of, in the, beginning of the film uh, by saying that I'm at a point in my life uh, where I don't want to hide behind these stories anymore. I want to find out what my story is. So was it the starting point of Born in Evan uh, to desire of finding your own story? Um, actually, even though I'm saying this as the protagonist, um, there's really two sides to the story because um, I am the director of the film and I'm at the same time the protagonist. So the goal that the protagonist has is uh, differs a little bit from the one I had as a director because um, at the very first beginning, I didn't want to appear in the film at all. I wanted to talk about the human rights violations and these crimes and massacres that had happened in the 80s that I, of course, knew about, um, but I didn't want to appear in front of the camera. I wanted to talk about the second generation, the children whose parents had been persecuted and murdered um, and um, tell their stories. And then in my research process, I realized that I needed to, I needed to start with myself. And in order to show what it means, what the consequences of, of, of these violations and crimes through time are, I, I needed to kind of use the dramatic structure of a journey that people might be able to relate to. Because we know if I would just, you know, make a journalistic approach where I just talk about all of the numbers and the statistics and people that had been murdered, the to torture methods and so on, it's very, sometimes it gets very far from to be able to relate to. So I, so I had to kind of very reluctantly had to um, yeah, find, find my way to, to, to appear and sh talk about the same issues by appearing as a protagonist. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, of course, as a protagonist, I wanted to know what are the specifics of my story, but as a director, that was just a starting point to talk about a collective um, experience um, that relates to Iran, but also bigger than that relates to the consequences of um, human rights violations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting to hear, actually, uh, that you didn't want to uh, appear in the film uh, in the first place, in the beginning yeah. of the production. Um, so there is this moment in your film where you find your quest maybe pointless uh, as you're not sure why you're making this film uh, until you spoke to sociologist Shahla Shafiq. Uh, was it your enlightenment moment where you realized the main reason of your quest, of your journey? Uh, well, again, um... Yes and no. Um, of course, at the beginning, for me, the priority was always to make visible the collective experience and to disappear as an individual. But because I chose that traumatic structure, I had to, um, I was still confronted with the inner reluctances that I had to make visible, you know, the inner obstacles that when you dig deeper and, it, and the stakes are higher for you and your family on the personal level as well, that of course you reach these limits. But I read Charla's work before I started working on the film. I read many books. I had been very, I had done one and a half or two years of research before I even started filming. So it is, it, it is, it was an epiphany, but at the same time it wasn't because that was the aim from the beginning on to just find, you know, to give worth to the individual, but the individual always being uh, planted within a collective experience. Yeah. But uh, with Shala, the interesting thing was that I had interviewed her for days and days. And, um, and it was very much about the academic or research-based um, work that she had been doing in comparing the ideological prison to 
dictatorial prisons uh, because Iran is uh, every prison and the Iranian prisons are ideological prisons where it's not about punishment in the sense of okay we, you, you committed a crime and now you're going to be in prison but um, rather than we need to break your belief system mm -hmm. you know we need to 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 make you believe our ideology through means of torture killing and so on so I had been doing interviews about these specifics with her for days but then, um, an hours long, but then on during this <laughs> interviews that I had, at the same time, it took place that I felt overwhelmed with everything I would feel, with everything that I would encounter and, and the reluctance from other protagonists and people I interviewed. And, and, I, and I wouldn't understand why, on one hand, knowing it is so important, and on the other hand, feeling such a wall of uh, rejection, not rejection, but reluctance. Mm -hmm. So... Um, at the end of 120 hours of material that I had and hours and hours long interviews with Sharla Shafir, the interesting thing is that that interview made it into the film because it combines the academic uh, work that she does, but at the same time combines it with a human quality of uh, support and the human quality of encouragement and, and having these two layers meet um, allows you know allows it from a dramatic point of view also the storytelling aspect but also it shows a, a quality of humanity that is so touching in a way yeah mm -hmm. i think it's so perfectly understandable that you you know uh, face these challenges uh, and i have yeah. a question uh, about this issue actually you you are sharing a personal story in your film yet it's not a personal story actually it represents mm -hmm. the story of an entire generation Mm -hmm. And like uh, Shahla said, your individual story, history is part of a larger uh, collective history. So when you mm -hmm. compare your thoughts and feelings about this issue, is there a difference between the starting and end point of the production of your film? Um, if there's a difference from the end point and the, uh, and the beginning of the production? In terms of your feelings and thoughts. Uh, um, I mean, altogether, I would say I worked six years on that film, so I am definitely another person at the end of it than I was at the beginning. And even though I used the dramatic structure of like the hero's journey, if you want, um, also it was on a, on a, on an individual level. It was a hero's journey because I had to, you know, face all of these um, fears and face the reluctances and face, you know, and it's also, you know. The thing is, it's not so much, sometimes obstacles appear as if they're on the outside and people are not willing to be interviewed or, you know, you make appointments and they're not happen. They appear to that these are the issues. But in fact, what really is the most difficult aspect is that you are dealing with such severe, hor horrifying, um, terrible uh, uh, human actions in a way that to have the courage to face them and to look inside obviously you are reluctant to do so that's why you know entire histories and historical narratives are based on denial because people do not want to look at it and and so so the so the film and what I, I thought it was necessary to say yes it's also you know my one of the protagonists she also says says that yes it is horrible to look at it and yes it is unbearable and it brings you to the edges of believing in life if you want but it is it is important and it's necessary and on the other side you will know even more why it is so important to stand up for the things that you do you know and what life you do actually want to create as a society, but also as an individual. So yes, to your question, it is very, it is very difficult and it is still very necessary to, 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 to confront these, these, um, these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. My final question um, will be about your family actually. As the film involves the story of your parents who were uh, once imprisoned in Evan uh, prison, there are yeah. a lot of familial affairs, moments in the film, and it must be really challenging and overwhelming sometimes. Can you tell us a bit about the major emotional challenges you faced during the production of the film? 
I mean, I, uh, yeah, one of the things I just named um, was just the confrontation with these crimes, be they that it considered, concerned so many thousands of people or an entire generation, but also that it con concerns the people that are the closest to you. And, you know, you always wish the best and for, for those. And if you know that they had been uh, victimized by these horrifying methods of um, of persecution, that's very hard to handle. Um, but in a way, I felt, you know, the film, my parents only appear, I mean, especially my mother at the beginning of the film and at the end, and my father appears in this second act uh, with one more, one, one or two more scenes, but they kind of serve as brackets because, you know, the journey is really meeting all these other people, joining these conferences, doing all these interviews, but these brackets, like being the starting point and then the return, um, to me, the most challenging thing was also in the editing process, always to investigate when is the personal necessary to tell a larger story and when is it just private and it doesn't belong there. Mm -hmm. So even though there's moments of gathering, like for example, the dinner at the end um, with my mom and my stepfather, or that they serve also it's not just, you know, sharing a personal moment of a dinner, but it's sharing the survival story of my stepfather, who is a, a descendant of Holocaust uh, uh, survivors, and how life continues with these, um, heri the heritage that we carry within our bodies, but also within our traditions or these moments of gatherings and so on. And this whole scene, scene, or scene where my mom reads from the Hafez, you know, for me, is not only serving a moment of a private mother-daughter um, situation, but it's really showing a survivor uh, that had never had the ability to go back to the country where she was born and she grew up in, who had been you know, dehumanized by a system in a, in a language and still decades later decides to sh share poetry in, in that language. So these are the, this I consider, valuable and, and necessary to be told, but not for the sake of sharing a personal aspect, but sharing something that relates in a, to, in a, to a larger context. Yeah. Um, I think it sounds a personal story, but it's not a personal story, actually, like you said, because there are other characters in the film, which is also related to the uh, issue, like you said, your stepfather and other characters. So uh, even if it sounds like a personal story, it's not actually. Um, mm. So, Mariam, thank you very much for sharing your uh, film with us. I think you illustrate the lasting impacts of human rights violations perfectly well, even on children with no direct memories to these violations. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for becoming part of our Q&A session. Thank you so much. <laughs> mm -hmm.